there, banditos. Welcome to a Friday episode of Dollar Bin Bandits. I'm Mike Farah, and we have yet another Mike on the show today. His name is Mike or Michael Schwartz. You probably know him as the newest co-host of Wizards, the podcast guide to comics. Our friends over there at uh, at that podcast. Uh, but now he is a published comic book author, and he has put together a comic called Armored. And Armored has already had one Kickstarter for its first two issues. But now, right now, you can get behind issues three through five, which will take you through the full story arc. And that's on Kickstarter right now. So you want to support that. And we get into everything Mike Schwartz and everything Armored and how he came up with the idea and how he's getting these major artists for the covers, like people like Jay Lee, David Mack, um, and what it really means to come sort of out of nowhere and just start writing your own comics and publishing them. So let's get to it. This is Michael Schwartz. And today we have yet another Mike on the show. His name is Mike Schwartz. Mike, welcome to the program. Hi, very nice meeting you, Mike. Yes, uh, we had a discussion before we started recording about Michael versus Mike, and we just decided, <laughs> you know, we'll just go with both. Yeah. So... Uh, We'll switch throughout the, the, the whole show. We'll just... Exactly. We like to keep the listeners and viewers on their toes. Exactly. Uh, so, Mike, we will start you out with the same question. Our patented first question. It is nobody else has asked this question of any of their guests. And that is, how did you first discover comic books? Um, it was all through my dad. My dad is a, a big, big time comic book collector. Um so it, I could, I was probably one, two, three years old going to comic book shops uh, in, in my local hometown, you know, being dragged by my dad. Um, and at the time, I think he was hunting for Silver Age comics. And just throughout the years, he would take me, you know, we'd be at the local comic shop every weekend or every other weekend picking up his pull lists. Eventually, he got me a pull list um, and going to uh cons and everything just throughout the years it was really you know him reading me comics that every every my love of comics is all because of him really he introduced me to it and then you know throughout the years like watching x-men the animated series batman the animated series i got more into comics and eventually kind of discovered which ones i liked best and kind of pursued collecting certain ones in you know once once i got into university i started to discover oh i like dc comics i'm going to collect those ones so it's always been a part of me do you remember were there comics that were yours as opposed to your dad's or were they mostly just kind of hand-me-downs from your dad oh no no i i did get a lot of hand-me-downs but mine so my first pull list was silver surfer and the incredible hulk so it would have been during the dale keown um run mm -hmm. and then the ron Lim run of silver surfer so that era is when i would i was starting to get my own comics and i remember he gave me these little like i don't know portfolio bin things to, and they had the Marvel superheroes on it. And he gave me that to like store my comics in on my shelf. <laughs> that was, that was, that's my earliest memories. And eventually I would, you know, get X-Men, uh, the, the Jim Lee, Chris Claremont X-Men and Spider-Man added to the list. So uh, I would, so I was about six or even f four or five where it's like really, really, I have, I have, deep nostalgic memories for going to the comic shop and getting my own books yeah that was definitely earlier than uh me and i think the other co-hosts here uh which we were kind of in our like i guess pre-teens <laughs> when we yeah. discovered comics so we're i think a bit older than you because those were actually some of my earliest uh issues too but it was more around like age 12 or 11 or 12 or something okay, like yeah, that yeah yeah but yeah, the Keown, um, Peter David run, I've talked about it before on the show, probably ad nauseum, uh, just one of my favorites, like my touchstone in comics collecting. And of course, we've uh, been lucky enough to have, you know, Ron Lim and Ron Mars talk about their their run on Silver Surfer, which again, was sort of foundational. So oh, awesome stuff. I always love hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. See, it's hard. 
as well because my dad was also buying me back issues to fill in the runs because he's all about like making sure you have a run yeah so uh, it's like i it's hard to remember at what point i started i just know there's somewhere in that run and even past the dale keown run that i was still getting all until when i have no idea <laughs> right right i could probably if we had more time just run into the basement and look at what my last <laughs> um hulk issue was i think it was before uh peter david left but um probably not too much before i yeah. just remember for issue 400 felt like i asked my dad for mylar for it uh you know the yeah. is it the green hollow like the foil cover right the yes yes yeah yes yeah uh, i remember and... that one yeah yeah <laughs> And I was like, this is going to be worth as much as your amazing fantasy dad. Give me a yeah. mylar. <laughs> it's like printed in gold. Like yeah. this is actual like precious metal that they've put on this comic. And therefore, exactly. yeah, um, little did we know, we didn't know anything about, you know, supply, demand, rarity, yeah. all that yeah. stuff. Um, so before we get to your uh, first foray into writing comics, which is kind of behind you off to your. I don't know, viewers right left, yeah. uh, you're right, um, <laughs> which is Armored. Uh, I understand that you got into kind of the entertainment business or uh, not publishing business, but entertainment business through screenwriting. So you are kind of an established screenwriter. How did you get into, you know, how did you get into that? Um, uh, okay, I should give you like the short story because I feel like it could go on forever. But the short story is, is I went to film school um, you know, I was still into comics, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I was a strong enough artist. And I felt like you had to be an artist to get into comics. I didn't mm. really understand how a writer became a writer in comics. And um, I was really into horror movies. So I went to film school uh, here in Toronto. And uh, from there, I, you know, I graduated uh, from film school and immediately went to work for Walt Disney Pictures in their marketing department for Canada. So I was doing publicity and promotions for Disney movies here, like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. And um, we did the prestige when I was there. And then eventually ended up at Fox Searchlight Pictures doing the same thing, working on movies like, um, oh my God, I think I was there when 28 Weeks Later was going on. Uh, and then I kind of just kept like, you know, I, I had been out of, the film production side of things. And I had kept going into these jobs where it was like marketing or, and um, my wife and I teamed up uh, as writers and we wrote, we were both working at these companies we didn't really enjoy working at because it wasn't what we wanted to do. And we were, you know, she was working with some writers at the company. She, she was kind of working with the development um, person at there and, uh, we, we just were like, well, maybe we should try writing a series. And so we, um, we wrote, we wrote a spec script and the, her producer she was working for was like, let's pitch this. Uh, they liked it enough to pitch it. And that kind of led us down that path. Um, we, we got an agent together. Like we, we really were pursuing the writing thing, but at some point I decided to go work in animation production, work on a movie called the nut job. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It has Will Arnett. It's like squirrels heisting a nut store. Yeah, I think uh, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. So I worked on that for a number of years and my wife went off and she had her own career in writing and eventually became a showrunner uh, for a kid's series. Um, but I stayed in animation and I, I became really good friends with the director of The Nut Job. And we, after he finished it, we wrote a movie together and it was just such a good experience. He liked working with me. I liked working with him. We kind of decided to team up. And uh, next thing you know, he's hired to direct a movie called No Malone. And um, that he basically gave me like the opportunity of a lifetime. He, he was stuck with like a 40 minute, um, uh, they call it a Leica reel, like an animatic or a story. It's basically yeah. storyboards cut together. And he's like, I don't have a full movie you know, the producers are freaking out. I'm in production. I need your help. And so I came in and I pitched him what I would do and ended up, you know, writing basically what the, I filled in the gaps to make it a whole movie. So the movie you see is what I wrote. Obviously he put a lot into it as well as a director. And uh, from there, that's how I got into writing. Um, 
you know, I had made a lot of short films, so he knew I wasn't just some guy being like, hey, I can write. But I, I had been pursuing it for so long and he kind of gave me that opportunity. So I owe him everything for my career in a lot of ways. He, he really kind of helped me out, I'd say. And then eventually we wrote, we've written like 12 to 13 movies together for producers. They just haven't seen the light of day. Our most recent one was an Arl Stein movie that actually got made so, uh, called Zombie Town. And uh, well, I mean, that's a fascinating story uh, that, you know, kind of that, I don't want to say typical at all, but sort of that Hollywood kind of magic, you know, that you're, you're, toiling away in sort of an area that you not not as creative or not as interested yes. in and then uh you get that big break um what I, what I would love to know because we don't talk to a lot of uh screenwriters especially those maybe who have been you know had had movies produced but what is that feeling of sort of turning in a script and then you know months or years later seeing the actual movie that came from that kind of like seed that you you put into it i know it gets remade along the way so it's not yeah. exactly as you've written it but still it's sort of like being played out on screen it must be kind of a gratifying feeling yeah you know like in in tv it the writers kind of run the show right like they're yeah. the ones kind of really involved in every step and then in movies the screenwriter writes the screenplay and then it goes off and gets made and they see it on opening day where I'm really lucky because I get to work with Peter. Um, his name's Peter Lepeniotis and um, he shows me everything along the way. So he was sharing, you know, cuts of No Malone with me. So I knew what was coming. I knew the producer on No Malone wanted to change the ending. So they changed the ending a bit. I wasn't caught off guard. I was okay a bit more but it is pretty it's pretty cool you know and I, I got to be on the set of zombie town as well and so um it, I, it wasn't a big surprise i guess it's always fun seeing how peter crafts the movie because he's really the person that does the final draft in a right. lot of ways the director is um so it's fun to see it come to life and in a lot of ways i try to forget what we had written um otherwise i think you could be pretty disappointed because there's scenes that get cut like it, it's just the way you know we're working on low budget movies up here in Canada they're not they're not Hollywood films by any means um so yeah you kind of have to temper your expectations but it is exciting I find it very exciting even if it's not how we wrote it, it it's still cool to see come to life right um well, that's great. And so after kind of, you know, slumming it in TV and movies, you decided to come to the rarefied air of not only comic books, uh, but podcasting as well. And so one more detour before we get to the comic books, which is that you are now a co-host of Wizards, the, uh, is it the podcast guide to comics? I always get the subtitle yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, so how did, you know, how did you get involved in that? And what's that experience been like? Okay, so years ago, Adam and Michael, I befriended over Instagram and one of their other um, co-hosts who's subbed a few times here and there, um, uh, they, I befriended them on Instagram and we would just chat about comics. And one day they asked me to, to just be a guest. And I think I was a guest twice. And then uh, Michael, the other co-host with Adam, he, he had to leave uh, the show. I don't know how long he's going to leave for. Maybe I'm the permanent co-host now. <laughs> but um, They just switch us Michaels and Mike's yeah, out. Yeah, like, you can fill in for me. When exactly, I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone would notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just got a, a message from Adam one day saying hey would you, you know would you like to fill in for michael then i don't, <laughs> i think the truth is, is he's like this way i don't have to change any of the words it still says co-host adam and michael right. no uh you know i had a great time doing the podcast as a guest years prior and when he asked i was just, like i love wizard magazine i still have all my wizards they're they're actually my dad's and mine i should say mm -hmm. my dad and my mom are divorced now, but uh, he had left all of his wizards at my mom. So the first time I did an episode, I had moved all of my wizards from my mom's to my house. So they're mine now. Um, but, 
yeah when he asked I just had to do it I was like I I need an excuse to go back and read these and this is that excuse really I I love revisiting that time period and we're getting we're now um on issue 93 we just recorded uh, uh episode 93 today which is issue 93 and next week we'll do a, a half issue uh where we dive deeper into um you know the issue and um uh uh this era of wizard is is when i i was kind of only reading spawn and maybe the darkness and hellboy and um like the odd horror comic and then in the early 2000s i was really into 80s cartoons again and you know the revival of transformers and he-man but then i i discovered dc's flash and so I'm like really excited to get back into that era of comics. So it was like perfect timing for Adam because he's not as familiar with this era. Yeah. I'd say. So I was like, yes, I cannot wait to talk about uh, all of that stuff that's coming up. Is that like the, is that during Jeff Johns and the yeah, return Jeff of Jones Barry and, Allen? Yeah. All that uh, stuff. Even before the return of Barry Allen, it was oh, okay. still when he was doing well, it was when Jeff Johns joined the book with, and he was doing it with Scott Collins. Um, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's when I, I got really into DC comics. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, and remind me because I was in and out of wizard, like fairly quickly in the nineties, like when it first premiered. So I think I, at one point had maybe like the first 10 maybe 15 issues okay. and and then I sort of took what what seems to be a, a lot of people take this break around I don't know like late high school early college <laughs> yeah. and then find their way back to comics I never found my way back to wizard but how how you're, you're pretty you're definitely over halfway right in terms of the entire publication oh run. my goodness uh, I should do a quick search but I feel like I feel like we're not past the halfway mark Oh really? I, it was I didn't realize it went that that, yeah. that long actually. Oh, it's really bad. Adam's going to be so angry that I don't know this. <laughs> we can cut this out. Yeah. <laughs> or Adam put on your earmuffs. Yeah, Adam, don't listen. 235 <laughs> issues. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, that I is knew we surprising were halfway. to me. Yeah. We have a lot of episodes left to do. And yeah. you know, uh, you know, I've just joined the podcast, but there's already more than 270 episodes cuz we also interview old wizard staffers we interview artists we interview writers so we we're we're kind of like a catch-all nostalgic trip i'd say in a lot of ways because we really are revisiting those time periods and what was happening um i saw that you recently maybe in the past couple months got the the big cheese carob seamus on the program for an interview yeah, I was just joining then. So that is Michael and Adam got to interview him. The big yeah. cheese. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so let's move to your uh, comic book journey, which, um, well, well, started off obviously with your dad and collecting and then, you know, came back to um, came back to it after maybe a little bit in the early 2000s. And then uh, you went on your sort of screenwriting um uh, a career tra- trajectory and then somehow decided i, I want to write a comic book uh, and so you you've written armored which i think and correct me if i'm wrong is going to be a five issue mini series is it that right it is it is even though the the sixth issue is almost complete <laughs> but it is a new story it's a whole new arc like if people want to drop off after five five that's fine no, don't say that no <laughs> but it is a, it, it'll it, it is a really big cliffhanger i i don't know if you enjoyed one through five i don't know how you couldn't continue i wouldn't be able to personally because it's it's really when the series is gonna take off and you'll see kind of the possibilities the series has I'm I'm intrigued. Uh, for those are the for those out there that are not familiar, uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about the armored story itself. Yeah, so it's about uh, an orphan named Andy, and um, his parents went missing uh, in the like out of nowhere. They just disappeared, and um, he two years in and out of foster homes. He eventually gets adopted by a couple, and 
this couple's kind of unusual because their son died um, two years ago as well. So Andy is the same age as what their son would have been. Um, so he moves into this house. It's out in the countryside. It's a. It's supposed to be sort of a nondescript European, you know, city or town that he that he's moving to, um, and he there's a castle nearby and something he's he's a kid that is always like trying to figure out what uh what happened to his parents he's very um curious he's a bit of a detective a bit of a sleuth so he wants to find out what happened to their son and goes to the castle where their son died um, because there's a bit of a mystery surrounding his death anyways he ends up at the castle and he discovers this, he falls into this ground, uh, the, the, the ground gives way and he falls into this old tomb where he finds this medallion or this, um, this piece from uh, like an armor. And yeah. he, he presses the button and this magical armor comes all around him and it has, it gives him powers. The only issue is it's still being haunted by the ghost who wore the armor hundreds of years ago when he was alive. And so now the ghost must train the boy uh, to use the armor uh, and kind of defeat some monsters and stuff. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. It was a really bad pitch. No, no, right no. Now, but I hope hopefully it gets the idea across. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's I, very cool. I, uh... the, the elevator pitch is medieval suit of armor, haunted by ghosts, fight monsters, mystery. <laughs> Love it. Um, and, and I got the chance to uh, read the first issue and it's it's exactly as you described, but but even better when you're actually reading it, obviously, oh, good. Uh, that, good. You, know, you know, the story um, comes through. And what's really great is the um, obviously the, the character development you're putting into it and the 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 relationship between the ghost and the, and the kid, I think, is going to be kind of the I don't know, but it's sort of the centerpiece and really what, you know, the everything hinges upon, which is, which is great. I, I love their, you know, interplay. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about uh, how this came about, you know, the genesis of the story and how you made the decision that this was going to be a comic book rather than what had been up to now your sort of forte of, of screenwriting. Yeah, I had the idea of, you know, a kid finding armor of some kind and it being haunted by a ghost. I always loved the idea. Like I would I would kind of like tell people like, oh, you know, it, it, the, the idea I have is a kid finds some armor and the ghost would be like, uh, you know, the genie from Aladdin. Kind of goofy, funny, a bit of a sidekick has to train them. But I didn't have anything more than that. And for years, it was just kind of in my head um uh at one point i had I, I was working at an animation studio in development and i pitched them they, they were working with um, jackie chan and they were looking for ideas to pitch his the the producers that worked with him and i kind of wrote up like a one page like oh here's an idea you know that jackie chan could be the ghost and um they immediately turned it down saying no jackie chan hates ghosts <laughs> So I was like, okay, <laughs> great. Like they Who didn't knew? even get, it didn't get to Jackie Chan's people at all. Um, I can't even remember when this, like the, it, like my brain is so fuzzy as to when that happened. I know it was shortly after we had our second kid, I was watching a lot of visionaries. Okay, like I brought it yeah. up in interviews before where I was watching the whole series of, do you remember that show? Knights of the Magical Realm or something? Oh no, I was yeah, actually Knights thinking- of the Magical of... Lights. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're these toys and they have like holograms on their chests and their staffs right. have holograms and it looks like ghosts, like in the imagery. Um, and the, the show was kind of neat. And that that's where I think I first got the idea of like a haunted suit of armor. It must have like been in there. I mean, a, a friend of mine, Jay Clark, he's really into visionaries as well. So we talk about it all the time. Um, but then, yeah, it just sat in my head and I was like, maybe it could be a movie someday, maybe a TV series. I don't know. Like I live in Canada. There's no budgets for anything here. Um, so it just sat there. And then, so in two, 2018, um, I had my entire comic book collection stolen from when I was a kid. 
and it was devastating. I swore I'd never collect another comic again. I was so upset. I was so angry. Uh, but then within a few months, I had bought the entire run of Silver Surfer volume two or three, whatever you call that, that series, oh, right. you yes. know, like one, one through 135. I, I don't even know what issue it goes to from some guy and it like worked out to 50 cents a piece. And I kind of said to myself, okay, I'm just going to collect anything that's like 50 cents or a dollar to try to get my collection back. And literally within a couple of years, I had amassed the biggest collection. And my wife's like, you said you weren't going to collect anything. <laughs> you know, I have this like comic book closet where I store all my boxes. It just filled up immediately. Um, I, yeah, I had so many comics and I was reading like five a night. You know, I was just reading so much. And then one day, you know, I've been so frustrated. The Peter and I have written so many movies for producers. Some years we write three movies together. And we're just like, when are these movies going to get like full financing? Because like, we don't even own the scripts because they pay us to write them. Mm. And so I'm like, we don't own it. We don't, um, we don't get to see them get made. No one knows that we're writing these things. I, I, I want to do something. And I was like, wait. Why don't I do a comic? I love comics. That's, I read more comics than I watch movies because I have two kids. I don't have time to be watching movies anymore. Right. But I always have time at night to be reading comics. And um, and uh, yeah, I, I immediately thought of that idea and was like, it, it's meant to be a comic. I don't even care if it ever becomes a movie or TV show. It doesn't need to be. I just want it to be a semi-successful comic that I could keep making it. And I wrote the first uh, just a script and I sent it to a friend of mine who had did some art for Marvel and uh, I just said is, am I in the ballpark is, to, is this any good and he was like it's really good and he wanted to do it ultimately he couldn't and he had to drop out and then I just had to figure out how to make it myself that's kind of the trajectory of Armored in a weird way having yeah. all my comics stolen led me to making Armored uh that that's a bizarre motivational uh story but very interesting and unique i've never i don't think i've heard that before and i'm <laughs> sorry you had your you know collection uh, stolen well, it's um, hard because i had a lot of original you know artists would draw on the backs of the boards for me as a kid so i had all those from like you know the uh, early the late 80s they had drawn who knows what what i had in there i don't even remember now oh uh, yeah um it is only matched by, I think it was Eric Larson and maybe even one other person who had their entire collection go up in smoke through a fire, Yeah, which I, I can imagine. I mean, and that, of course, takes away not only the comics, but, you know, your your home as well. Um, but those are just, yeah, just having it, having a collection one day and the next it not being there is... Uh, kind of devastating <laughs> i've actually met a lot of people with this story there's a lot of people i've connected with since telling my story and them being like i i know what you went through like it's almost like a support group in a yeah, weird way that's what i was about to say and you know this is i don't know if i've actually said this on any interviews i'm sure i have um but like armored you know it, it, i i kind of was like writing it during the end of the pandemic so the, there was a lot of you know people died during the pandemic and yeah. um but the the book really is about loss and overcoming loss and I, I think a big part of that was me trying to overcome the loss of my comics as well because I, I was very fortunate I didn't lose anybody sure. during the we lost my wife's uh, grandmother during COVID um and you know that that's really sad as well but like I think all these this loss, it became a part of Armored as well. Like that is the theme of the first five issues, at least in over, the, trying to overcome that yeah. that feeling. Yeah, I think that's a very deep area to explore and, and plumb, plumb the depths of, uh, so to speak. So um, it's, a, it's a great um, foundation, I think, yeah. for, for, a, for a cool story. Um, so... I think it kind of leads us to, you have this idea, you want to do it as a comic, you made that decision. Yeah, I wrote a script. Um, you wrote a script. Um, but first, I, I, I'm I, just, this interview is going to be so long, I keep throwing things at you. No, 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 go ahead. The thing that 
I did first was because I've written so many screenplays. I was like, I want this to feel like a comic. It has to be structured. So I took every number one issue of Jeff John that Jeff Johns had written that I had accessible to me really quickly. And I literally created an Excel doc of how he was structuring things just to fully understand it. And I was reading other comics, you know, I was reading a lot of Tom King. I was reading a lot of Tinian, Tinian, uh, I was reading anything, everything and studying what their patterns were and what I liked best and what their structure was. And that's how I wrote the script. You know, I don't know. I know there's a lot of people that want to get into comics and I think it's interesting to hear how people write, but I didn't want this to feel like I, I, I naturally write as if it were a movie, but I really wanted it to feel like a comic because I'm a comic fan. I don't want people to come to this and be like, this feels like the first few scenes of a movie. This isn't. <laughs> that makes sense. And yeah. I, I think comic fans definitely appreciate that, uh, especially coming from a different field. You don't want, you know, some interloper coming in and being <laughs> like, right, you know, I'm just going to write some comics because I'm, you know. Yeah. I don't want to do this as a movie or I don't want to do this, you know, for some people as a, as a novel or what have you. So, um, but you must have run into the, um, at some point run into sort of the reality of wall of, well, I can't do this by myself, <laughs> a comic, especially as a writer, you know, you do need, uh, obviously the art, uh, is a strong part of the comic book, uh, formula, Yep. Um, how did you think about once you had a script, um, getting it produced? Uh, how did you hook up with Clover Press? Had you made the decision about Kickstarter? How did you get, you know, hook up with your artist? Um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, that was such a learning curve for me too because I didn't know what to do once. Once my friend had said, you know, I can't do it. Um, I asked him, I was like, how do I get an artist? He's like, I don't know. I am an artist and I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I literally went into Google and said, how to find comic artists? I'm writer. I think I typed in something so stupid like that. And immediately a Facebook group popped up called Connecting Comic Book Writers with Comic Book Artists. And I was like, oh, this is great. And one of the first posts I see is from a, a person named Chris Stevens. And he was an, he's, he is an Eisner award-winning uh, writer. And he was segueing into becoming an editor for a lot of indie books. And I recognized one of the books because I had been following kind of the progress of this guy on Instagram creating his own comic. Uh, and it was The Golem of Venice Beach. I don't know if you're familiar with that graphic novel at all. I've heard the name. So Clover, yeah. put, Clover put it out as well. And um, so I connected the dots. I was like, oh, okay. So this guy is legit. He's not really, like if he's putting together this person I've been following and this person has Bill Sienkiewicz on his book, Jay Lee on his book, it's got to be legit, right? So I contacted Chris being like, I need help. Can you help me with this? And Chris again, another person, Armored would not exist without Chris Stevens. There's so many people like I have to thank for helping me get it this far. And Chris is one of, one of the first people um, to really see kind of my vision and really help bring it to life. Um, finding Ishmael Hernandez, our interior artist um, and obviously co-creator. He um, just Chris, Find, it's seeing his art pop up on on Facebook and being like, "What do you think of this?" And you know, I was I was like, "It's not like art you see in DC and Marvel." I love it, but will uh, comic book fans, you know, will it connect with them? I I could I I didn't know what to do. My wife, who, who's she reads graphic novels, but she doesn't read comic book floppies, and um, I was like, "Do you like it?" And she really liked it. And I, and I thought, "Okay, well, if you like it and you're not a comic fan, then there must be something here. Let's let's go for it." And and Chris was really, he was like, "You gotta, you gotta do it." And so we jumped on Ishmael. I hired him uh, as the artist, and I hired Chris to be my editor. And we were off to the races. Basically, we did one issue, and you know that was interesting because you. <laughs> I didn't know what to do once it was done. Like Chris had a contact at Dark Horse. They turned it down. 
I think they just didn't want something that was like all ages at the time, or I, I don't even know what the reason was. Who knows? Maybe they thought it was garbage, <laughs> which I don't think it is. So I yeah. don't know what the reason was. Um, Let's but, say that didn't, that was not, that didn't enter into their, yeah. you know, um, equation. But there was, you know, I had some other kind of connections kind of introducing me to some other um, publishers and I was, kind of on the fence about all of them you know I really wanted image at first and so I sent it to this void just send it into like this the submission and you're like will they read it did they read it you don't know and literally within days of sending it in Chris says oh you should meet Hank uh Canals at at Clover and I immediately was like wait is that Hank that co-wrote Youngblood with Rob Liefeld and <laughs> I was immediately like very impressed by that aspect alone and um and then I met Hank and, and he really liked the book and it really resonated with him and you know he wanted to work with me and Chris on it and so I was like he's so nice I I just I the the sounds of this company is great the way the company works is they kickstart everything so okay. it's not a decision. It's just that's how they do it. So like it, they they do a lot of Marvel art of books. They just did um, the uh, Marvel art of Russell Do Dodderman. The Marvel. Oh art yeah, of I think I got an earlier book uh, or a couple of books. Um, Malieve um, and, and Mac. Yeah. 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 So um, uh, I don't know if they were already planning those or not. I, they may not have been. I, it's hard to remember now, but you know, I was just excited that that Hank was so passionate about it and understood the story we were telling and 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 the potential for it. And so, yeah, that that's kind of it. And you know, they said we're going to kickstart it, and, and with you know, months later we were kickstarting it. I had no clue how it worked at all. I backed numerous kickstarters in the past. But, you know, I, I didn't know what went into it. And it is a lot of work. And that's why I'm so thankful of them, because I could never, ever do a Kickstarter myself. I'm just, I don't, I have too much else on my plate. It's it's so tedious. It's it's a lot of work. And they put a lot into it. And they're really about quality. Uh, like, you know, like even the, the like when you, when I felt armored for the first time, I was like, oh, this feels good. Like it, it feels like a good quality product. So that was, yeah, that was how it happened all the way up to Clover. Wow. Um, that's a lot of great sort of organic, uh, very organic growth, I, I guess, <laughs> uh, or exploration that, you know, you found not only the artist you, uh, through, through an editor and then found a, uh, publishing company and then that was willing to take on or that their, their business model um, required sort of this Kickstarter stuff, which is another, you know, yeah, another big learning curve. Um, it's great that you got to do all of that. I mean, and, and uh, I guess, you know, fulfilling and you must feel also, you know, an incredible amount of luck to some degree um, in that, you know, there are, I'm sure hundreds of other folks that are really like um scrapping along to find an artist and then to get something produced and then find so you know kudos that um it all sort of came together yeah there there is definitely a lot like it you know it's luck it's it's circumstance it's very interesting how it all happens i i will say it is a very expensive um <laughs> i fund the project myself so it is a very expensive uh venture <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and a lot of people are like like people within comics is like why are you getting into comics you work in film it's supposed to be the other, the other way yeah and i just love comics so much so i really you know i hope i hope i can make my money back that's kind of the goal yeah like i breaking even would be a dream come true that yeah. that's the way i'm looking at it so I just love comic books that much that I wanted to pursue it. And even Clover, when I, you know, when I started talking to them, I said, it has to be monthly issues. It's coming out. It's like a 30 page comic. I don't, I don't want to go straight to graphic novel. They do a lot of graphic novels, which mm -hmm. is great, but I go to the comic shop every Wednesday. I want other people to go to the comic shop and see it. Even if it, you know, I, I just, 
I had to have that experience. Yeah. I don't know if the next arc will just, we may just go to graphic novel. I don't know. We finished issue six. We'll see what happens. Uh, we'll see how one through five does. It is a bit of an interesting release. So we'll see if everyone can stick around. <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah. what exactly was kickstarted? Is it the first issue, the first five? Um... So we, they did an interesting thing. I'd say it was a bit of a test, testing ground, because they haven't done a lot of, um single issues uh periodical comics like they they've done a few but not a ton and so with the kickstarter it was uh they kickstarted issue one and the stretch goals were to unlock other issues so uh, okay we hit a stretch goal where we unlocked issue two but did not unlock issue three so issue three was like fifteen thousand dollars okay unlock. And I'm an unknown in comics. Like I, I, I'm starting to meet a ton of people, um, thankfully, but like I, no one knows who I am. Like a few people, I, I've met a lot of people that have kids that love No Malone. Like that is a very popular movie. It's mm -hmm. one of the most watched movies probably on Netflix. Um, there's a lot of kids who like gnomes. Uh, What's not but, to like? Yeah, but I don't know how many people, you know, they may see the Jay Lee cover and be like, oh, it looks cool, but it's the No Malone writer. <laughs> so, you know, I'm having to prove myself. Sure. Bit. Like people, like I'm, I'm, I'm trying so hard to be like, trust me, you, I don't think you'll hate it. You may not, it may not be your favorite comic, but I think you'll maybe have fun with it. Um, some people have loved it. Some people have been like, I need to read the next one. And I've, I've sent them like the first three issues. Like I know someone that's reading it to their kids and that they backed the comic. So they actually got the PDF and the kids keep asking for issue three. So I sent them a PDF of issue three just so they could see what happens. <laughs> um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Where yeah, I no, going? absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, but, but further to that, uh, are the issues, the issues are coming out also yeah. being published right and so you can so, go to your yeah local the, comic they, book shop and and get them as they come out yeah i think the kickstarter is, in a way is it's really good because it kind of is like here's proof that there is an interest in it and when they kickstarted issue one we got like a ton of press for it like i was i did a ton of interviews um it, it it was just so much interest and then we had enough people buy it that clover was like oh yeah okay we can definitely like release this in stores so issue one and two were kickstarted. um then the plan was to do a bi-monthly release okay. but before that we were going to kickstart three to five um but we had some printing issues with the foil cover the j lee foil cover um we were uh, clover wasn't happy with how the foil was looking and so it it postponed us a bit and then um the release date got postponed a bit so now we're in this weird territory where one and two come out back to back we're gonna have a bit of a gap over the mm -hmm. summer and then three four and five in the fall but literally any day now we are pre-launching the next kickstarter for three four and five so people are going to be able to buy one to five or three to five depending on what you own already got it okay so it's it's an interesting release we'll yeah. see what happens i yeah. i just want armored to be out there i don't care how you buy it um i just i hope people get a chance to check it out because i i'm really proud of how it's turned out and i think people are responding pretty yeah. well yeah yeah um well uh we're excited to help help you along in that process yeah, and you. uh uh i you know nowadays with the way the business is you you have to experiment you have to do yeah. you know different kind of publication um releases and you know kickstarters along with traditional it's just, it's kind of the way of the world. And uh, I think, you know, any way you can get it out there is is the right way. <laughs> what I also like too, is that, um, you know, here I can show you some of the, so like when we kickstarted it, you know, this is the main cover. I should also mention, this is by Nick Patera. So Nick, Nick was a huge um, supporter of the comic. 
early on. He he did Axe Wielder John. I don't know if you're familiar with his graphic novel. Yeah, I, I um, think I've heard of that. I yeah. think he 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 did that over Zoom, uh, Zoop, I believe, which yes. is a, also a crowdfunding website for comics. Um, he did the Manhattan Projects with Jonathan Hickman. Mm -hmm. um, and so he he did our very first cover, and this is it. It's kind of the kid friendly cover, I'd say, because I have a lot of kids that buy this comic now. Sure. I found when I I did a free comic book day signing, and this is the one all the kids were grabbing. Yeah. Although the odd kid wanted the really expensive uh, Chrome cover, but um, <laughs> but anyways, he was the first one, and I I really um, have to thank him for helping to get this even to Clover because I think this cover is really striking and yeah, you know, it kind of just tells you the whole story <laughs> right here in the image. It's very cool. Um, but then we also had uh, I you know I'm very fortunate enough to get Jay Lee to do a cover. This is the Jay Lee cover. Um, and then I reached out to Scott Collins mm -hmm. just over Instagram being like, I'm a huge fan of your run on flash. And so he did a cover for me and a friend of mine who is a movie poster artist, um, Matthew Terrian did this, uh, portrait cover. Right there. Nice. So, uh, what I liked about Kickstarter too, is a lot of them are, ex it's exclusives, right? Like we're a small book where we can't release 10 different variants or even four variants. So we made the Nick cover our main and then uh, the J Lee foil is a one in five variant. But on Kickstarter, you could get any cover. It was like, get whatever you want. You right. Know? Pick, you can even go crazy and get the, you know, $50 Chrome Matt Terrian book. So it's really shiny. Um, and uh, what I like is, so I feel like, if you if you're willing to take a risk on the comic you can get these really really cool variant covers that'll only be available there even nix is different uh than the direct edition of nix so there is slight variations even on those i like that aspect of it and i think our next launch now that people know how we're releasing these books um i think we're only doing one cover for three and five to direct market and it's we are not going to have that cover even available on Kickstarter. It'll be probably the art, but it it won't be exactly the same. It'll be different somehow. On Kickstarter, it may be foil only, and on direct edition, it won't be. It'll be non-foil. So I kind of like that aspect too. So it's like, yeah. who's willing to jump into Armored 1 to 5 and buy just all five foil covers because you won't be able to get them on store shelves? Uh, I don't, I don't like the exclusivity of it. It's kind yeah. of fun. Yeah. That is a big aspect of Kickstarter. Um, I forgot who we were talking to about this, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are doing Kickstarter, not only, uh, you know, independent books, but um, those like uh, Jimmy Palmiotti, who yeah. does now a few Kickstarters a year and just really loves the format. And he's like, you know, you put out one, you put out a good product and, you know, that kickstarts you to the sort of next kickstarter right because people are satisfied with you delivering what you delivered but it's also kind of this community and also it's it's collectors in some sort of way like the kickstarter community definitely brings out the collector in you and yeah. so the little exclusives the stickers the foil covers things like that really um are very sticky on kickstarter Yep. Whereas uh, they may be within a store, you know, maybe not as special, especially like, you know, going, comparing like one book to another on the yeah. shelf. Um, yeah. And, and I, I have to say that is, you know, he brought that up and um, I thought to myself, I'm like, that is exactly what I do. It's like, I go on these things and I'm like, oh, this looks interesting. It's like, Ooh, they've got this kind of cover or ooh, they've got, you know, you can get the whole story <laughs> or get it signed or whatever. And I'm like, it's just, you know, pulls on those little collector um, exclusivity, like you said, uh, you know, strings in your brain. And you're just yeah. like, ooh, I should I should get a little bit more than I thought I was going to get. Well, you know, the the J Lee variant for stores is a one in five variant. So not many people are going to get it. And so. And I know a lot of people, it's their favorite cover from issue one. Sure. And so I'm like, the the only way you can, like, 
so diamond is almost sold out of armor issue one already and it's been a week and Congrats. luna releases um their books next week so stores that order from lunar will get theirs next week so we'll see what happens but we're going to be launching again where you'll be able to buy um uh issues one through five but it's a limited we have a limited amount of the first print of issue one of that jay lee cover and i'm like this is your chance people if you want that cover get it from kickstarter because it's not going to be printed again i unless it becomes a huge huge book and this is it kind of thing you know well then you're gonna have to do the gold foil yeah we'll have to, to do indicate something. that it is a second print but still Absolutely. a special book absolutely like spider-man number one yeah which was what it start out did it start out silver and then went gold for the second printing i don't i don't remember the, yeah, the, remember the mcfarlane one but or were they just a, out there or were they just variants may, maybe they were variants yeah. I, I don't well, think the, they had taken advantage of this whole like this variant thing had not come along um which is weird because you know we were talking to and just to go off on a quick tangent um uh tom brevoort and um bob budiansky i was like losing names there um about the marvel trading cards and they were talking about you know when they hit upon this uh this approach with chase cards right so you would only within packs you would only get like one out of every five packs would have this specific chase card and i wondered like did they not at that point see the you know potential for chase covers which eventually we got to right which yeah. is exactly what you're describing i was like they should have taken that lesson from the cards and applied it to the comics right then <laughs> um uh although you know there there are definitely uh, various opinions on <laughs> yeah, the the whole thing with uh, variant covers but um yeah i it's just it's just very cool it, you know exclusivity definitely gets the uh gets the mind working uh and uh i i'm i'll tell you i'm in for the uh one through five because i missed the initial kickstarter and I'll, I'll i'll be one of the first jay lee uh <laughs> gotta get it yeah jay lee covers um so okay so we know where we're going we know we know where we've been we know where we're yeah. going although mostly you bit. know where we're going yeah um but beyond these beyond these five you said you've written six I mean, yeah. you you have started this as a book that you want to be a continuous series, an ongoing, if you will. Yeah. Um, I which... literally said that. I would say that to my editor. I'm like, this is an ongoing series. And I'm sure yeah. he'd be like, you're nobody. What are you talking about? <laughs> you're just going to start the ongoing. Yeah, I'm like... ongoing. Everyone will read it. They're going to come in droves. Right. You know, yeah, a little yeah. bit of Feel the Dreams here, you know, sure, Mike? Sure. like I'm like, if if I print it, they will read it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, <laughs> you got to have the optimism. It. You got to have the optimism. Um, wh- how far in the, I mean, I'm sure you don't have all the scripts written, but. I'm way how... too lazy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you sort of have a horizon as to where the story is generally going? Um, really... Or is it something where you're maybe a few issues ahead and you're just thinking of it in arcs and just kind of rolling out the car or writing it as you're rolling it out you know the the full story i've envisioned as 50 issues and it would be like for every five issues uh you know a, a, a graphic novel essentially so each uh, so it's a story arc per five issues up to 50 that's how i've envisioned it i have these crazy crazy ideas but the truth is um, I know the end and I, I, I'm not, I'm not a millionaire. I don't make that much writing independent Canadian movies. So I, I could, and I probably would, and uh, at least finish this story by issue 20. That's kind of where I'm, you know, anything could happen. You know, it could be the next Harry Potter. I don't know. Uh, stranger things have happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> um Stranger so things has literally happened. <laughs> exactly. But I have I have an idea of how I want to end it uh, for 20 issues. Obviously, just because I end it doesn't mean Andy doesn't still have armor and can't do uh, I can't start a whole new saga. But this story, I'm kind of seeing it as 20 issues. 
and that's where it would end. So four four arcs. Um, but I would love for it to be like fifty to tell this full story about Andy all the way through. But it'll probably be twenty, is my guess. <laughs> well, well, we'll look forward to something between twenty yeah. and fifty at least. It's, maybe yeah. maybe fifty, you know. And, and to answer your question, I have uh, about like what I have written. I have you know six and seven are written. Eight, nine, and ten are are de really detailed outlines that I'm just too lazy to put in script form at this point. I'm just like, right. um, I can tell you one thing. Um, you know, since I am on a, a Wizards podcast, we we are in the early stages of doing a half issue, a Wizards podcast half issue for Armored. So that is uh, written. The script is written. Uh, we have some old wizard staffers uh, or artists that are lending their talents to our book. <laughs> wow. Um, and this is all masterminded by Adam and Michael on the podcast. And yeah. I'm obviously uh, a part of it as well. And Ishmael will be starting the art on the half issue after he's done six, actually. That is very cool. So we're going to do a small Kickstarter just for that at some point as well. And um, can we maybe expect a zero issue like from oh, DC Zero Hour? Now you're getting my brain working. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> and, then, and then Armor Team Up. We have to, you know, you got to think well, about all these permutations, you okay, know. Let's do that after issue 50, Armored <laughs> Team Up. <laughs> all right. So last uh, question, and that is now that you uh, have officially entered the, the comic book world and you have your first story going, uh, is there any going back? Even if, even if Armored, you get to 50 and beyond, uh, what if you get to only 20? and and it's done are you going to continue to work in this world uh yeah i'm on issue two of another series already with an artist from italy who yeah who just wrapped up issue one <laughs> so my right. wife and i wrote a graphic novel um I, I was working in visual effects uh for a few years and the whole industry imploded once the writer strike happened and it hasn't come back. So my wife and I wrote a graphic novel um, together. It was a story we've had for like 10 years. And we were like, well, you know, maybe we just tell it in this form. Again, We, the budget to make this into a movie would be insane. And, you know, this is the perfect medium for the story we want to tell. And so we just did it, wrote it. And yeah, so you have another comic. So yeah, I'm. I think I'm in it. For life now it's yeah <laughs> too serious now <laughs> i have no publisher yet i'm it's early early stages you know just one issue done we don't even have the lettering done yet we're just waiting for the letterer to get some free time and yeah and we're back what did you think of the latest mike on mike interview i love talking to mike he has a great first name and he's a really interesting guy and uh, wish him nothing but success with his uh, Armored uh, Comics, which, as you heard, is intended to be an ongoing um, story. So plenty more to come on that. Please get behind his Kickstarter for issues three through five. I'm catching up, so I'm getting one through five. I wasn't there for the initial Kickstarter. Um, but it sounds just like an amazing um, story, you know, kid-friendly uh, supernatural stuff, uh, all the kind of ingredients that we love around here at the Dollar Bin Bandits. So thanks, Mike, for coming on the show. We'll have to have you down the line. I'm sure we'll do some cross-pollinating with wizards. Um, but that'll do it for this episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits. Thank you all for listening, for viewing, rating, five stars, reviewing, subscribing, doing all the great stuff that help us get more episodes into your what are they? Ear holes. So thank you again, and we'll see you next issue. <laughs>